you know, you're, you're bouncing back and forth with poetry, whereas prose, it keeps going a certain direction. Okay, okay. Well, I think that's a good example. I hadn't thought of it quite in that direction, but I, I think this is true. But, I, you know, the poem is to create an emotion in us. And prose is to just put out into everyday language to talk about. And Greg's heard me say this in our other Bible study, just the facts, ma'am, just the facts. Remember Dragnet? Yeah. You know? No, I don't remember. That was before me. <laughs> yeah, right. Okay. Well, someday I'll inform you. But anyway, you know, this, this is, and this is part of what I have, I have had a little problem personally in reading and understanding the Psalms because I'm one of those, just the facts, ma'am, just the facts. But you read them and it, it, it does create a feeling if you read them correctly and get the feeling of what they're trying to tell you. So we talked about it being of songs and poems of prairie, of praise and prayer. What about lament? Hmm. It's a sorrowful um, recitation of grievance, sort of. Okay. Yeah. It's a prayer. Yeah. It's a prayer. yeah. To, to mourn out loud. You don't have to necessarily out loud, but you have an inward feeling of mourning. And these are, I think a lot of this is included in the poetry of the Book of Psalms. Um, I think it's in the guidebook. But he says, let me, says that um, you really don't learn Psalms until we are praying them. We're praying the Psalms. And to talk about a Psalm should not be, praying is not a religious bull session. I don't know where I got that, but it kind of fits. Okay. I think we're gonna have time. If you would turn to page seven in your guidebook, down at the latter part, uh, of that page, that last paragraph before it says suggestions for individual studies, change glasses. Everything that everyone can feel or experience in relation to God is in these prayers. You will find them the best place in scripture to explore all the parts of your life and then to say who you are and what is in you. Guilt, anger, salvation, praise to the God who loves, judges, and saves you in Jesus Christ. That's what he designed these studies to do. Okay? How many Psalms are there? Much. You got your Bible open? Look at you got it on Psalms one. Should have it on Psalms one. Go to the back of it. And what's the last Psalm? It is one fifty. One fifty. There are one hundred and fifty Psalms. Who wrote the Book of Psalms? A lot of them, David. 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 Yeah, not, David? All. not all of them. Okay. Yeah, you're both right. You know. I, my first thought was, well, David wrote them. Well, that's a 52% correct answer. <laughs> David wrote 78 of the Psalms. Moses wrote one. Aphis wrote 12 of them. The sons of Korah wrote 10. Now, I don't know who they are. Maybe MJ could explain that a little bit. They're uh, understood to have been worship leaders within okay. the courts of the kings of Israel. Yeah. yeah. Then one he, one is Ezra, Ezra here Heman, and another one Ethan wrote one. Solomon wrote two. 
So there are 45 of them that are anonymous. Now, so when was this, when was this written? When were the Psalms written? Over a long period of time. Now, my the information that I looked up, um, I'm not going to say it's totally accurate, and maybe nobody really has an accurate anyway. But Saul, David, and Solomon were their time was approximately in 1100 BC to 1000 BC. If I remember right, Moses was 1600 BC. That was 600 years before. When the others were written, we don't know. In my mind, you have the right to disagree with me. It is just like us if we went back in history and took songs that they sang in grandpa's time and dad's time and grandma's time and our time and our kids' time and put them all into one book. Our, our, not our, our everyday hymnals are basically the same thing. Am I wrong? So this is what the book of Psalms is all about. And these books were put together over a long period of time. Now, the thing we have to remember is back in those times, they didn't have a printing press. They couldn't write or read. This was handed down word of mouth. When they finally got to the point that they could transcribe those, they transcribed them into Hebrews and made the book of Psalms. So this is what we're dealing with. Here again, in some of my investigation, it brought out the point. In the Old Testament, which we'll read, and that's what we'll study basically here, is the Psalms. Those were transcribed into Hebrew. As the New Testament came around and the spread of Christianity came apart, came out, to the Gentiles, they transcribed it into Greek. And the book of Psalms is one of the most, excuse me, referred to books in the New Testament. Maybe Isaiah is more, but it doesn't make any difference. But anyway, it's, but sometimes when you read in your New Testament, and if you go back and look in the Old Testament, there's a little bit of difference there. And part of this is done because of the transcription from Hebrew to Greek. So that don't let that throw us in what we're doing. Any comments, any questions, or any ideas? Another description of of the Psalms that I've, I've found, it provides the feeling of joy, pain, fear, security, triumph, tragedy, confidence, doubt, hope, despair, with piety and honesty and boldly. But in every case, they refer, they reaffirm the Hebrews and our hope in the loyal love of, love of God and in the sovereignty and their commitments to serve him. Does this make any sense? Bai, are you shaking your head yes or no? I am shaking my head yes. <laughs> okay. Any comments you'd like to make? Well, the Psalms for me also have an overriding theme, in my opinion, of a lot of praise to God. 
a lot of description okay. of his power. Um, a lot of the Psalms are intense prayers asking for forgiveness. A lot of them are for thankfulness. And a lot of them are about trust, trusting God, trusting his plan for your life. And I personally, um, Proverbs and Psalms are two of my favorite books in the Bible. Absolutely. Places I go to look for guidance or help or you know, answers. Um, yeah, I, I think you're right on. Absolutely. And when you think about it, sometimes even in one Psalm, it will have praise and prayer, asking for asking for forgiveness, asking for for help, praising God for what he's done and praising him for what he's going to do. Um, Oh, I don't know, some time ago. I don't know whether you can see it or not. This is a neat book on the life of David. Yeah, great book. And someday, maybe we, she would lead us in a, in a Bible study on this book. It takes a lot of reading because you not only read, have to read the book to really get the basis of it. You have to read the Old Testament, First and Second Samuel somewhat first kings and some of it but um, again it's by eugene peterson eugene peterson wrote our guidebook eugene peterson is the man that translated the message if you remember okay but someday but this has helped me in trying to understand what the psalms are really talking about and what david went through you know, david david's life shit. It, it wasn't all glory. Was he was weird. a king, but, but he, he lived higher and fell harder time and time again, more than anybody I can think of, any time, any place. But the only thing that stayed steady was his faith in God and God's faith in him. So it, it's a great book, and he wrote most of the Psalms. We'll get part of that. Any other comments? Any other suggestions? Any other comments on the book of Psalms? No? Good intro. Thank you, Don. Well, that's... Uh, there's a lot can be said, a lot can be read. I hope that... Uh, I have the time now, and I like to research some of this the best I can. Like I've told you before, I don't know anything, but I'm opinionated. Uh, but you don't learn anything. You don't know anything that you haven't learned from somebody else. So I'm always right. I just may be misinformed. <laughs> the part of this group is to discuss these things. And if I am misinformed, I want you to tell me. This is a discussion group. I'm about done talking. I'm going to turn it over to you. I'm going to give you some questions, and you give me the answers. Any other comments? Okay. See which pair of glasses I have on. Excuse me. Let's turn to page um, 10 in our guidebooks. Chapter one, praying our inattention. Have any ideas what that amounts to? Yeah, I, I'm, I'm a prime example of uh, getting sidetracked all the time, you know? Oh, you're the only one that ever does that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And this is part of what he's talking about in our lesson today. I, I'm not, I don't, personally, I don't quite get that out of Psalm 1. And maybe you can help me do that. But the whole idea of our inattention is basically what he is talking about and what we're thinking about. So uh, let's go to that page, praying our attention, Psalm 1. Let me read that, and you look at, look at it in the book. 
family responsibilities, work deadlines, education goals, home maintenance, so much is clamoring for our attention each day. And that's not to mention the distractions that come from the media, wow. Most of us can't keep step immediately, can't step immediately from the noisy, high stimulus world into the quiet concentration of prayer. Is that what you're talking about, Greg? Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Group discussions. What thoughts and concerns most often distract when you begin to pray? This is a personal question. If you'd like to answer, I'd like to hear it. Things I need, need to get done, accomplished, you know, selfish ambitions, uh, those things. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Need to do. How about things that you've already done? Yeah, a lot of that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I always felt that I was never as concerned about what I already did, sort of what I didn't get done. <laughs> but, uh, uh, Vi, you got any comments? I can't see yeah. your face. <laughs> That's okay. Um, yeah, with the way things are going in the world right now, what um, concerns me or where my thoughts drift to, unfortunately, are the um, fires, the okay. riots, the political arena with the big election coming up. I find all of those things kind of distracting me a lot. And then, you know, they not only distract me, but they also lead me to, um, I start off praying for my child, for example, and then I find I'm praying for, you know, all of these other things as well. Um, just my mind going from lots of different things with what's going on in our world right now. But it's also quite distracting as Ab well. Absolutely. You know, the news the other day was made some statement about what's the cause of high blood pressure. <laughs> and I just out of the top of my head says the national news. My yeah, the media. Watching <laughs> watch CNN. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so, and I, I think you're absolutely right. We've got so many things going on. And in and, and all honesty, that's why I feel it's so important to have these Bible studies, so important to have church, so important to, because I'm still current, firmly convinced in my own mind, no matter what they say or do, no matter who's elected. Good Lord still in charge. Yes. Amen. We don't if we don't put our faith in him like David did, we're gonna be in this limbo for an awful long time. Now I have some other thoughts that I could say, but some of them aren't shouldn't be thought, definitely not said, and certainly not written. So I'll keep it to <laughs> myself this time. <laughs> and not recorded. <laughs> not recorded. Well, I know. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Stop yeah. the recording, MJ. <laughs> no, no, I wouldn't. Have, I wouldn't even say until you one on. Well, I might one on one, but I. You like say, say I, one on one, Don. Okay. <laughs> huh? You aren't afraid to tell me one on one. If what your thoughts are, we can handle it. Oh no, I don't always. I don't. I don't always tell you what I'm thinking. <laughs> Good thing. <laughs> That's one thing that makes me closer to the Lord is some of the thoughts I have, is, we'll get into this a little later, but some of the thoughts I have, I have to go to the Lord and say, hey, forgive me, Lord, right now. I can't, <laughs> wait, I can't wait till prayer time. I've got to do it right now. <laughs> that's, that's true of all of us, I think. Don. Um, yes. Yes. For me, it is, at least. Yes. Okay, let's continue on reading here in the personal reflection. Attempt to clear your mind before you begin to study. Sit in silence for a few minutes. What thoughts and concerns come to mind? List them. Ask God to help you focus on what he wants you to learn. Ask God to help you focus on what he wants you to learn. Psalm 1 is not a prayer, exactly, but the preface to prayer. We do not begin to pray by praying, but by coming to attention. Psalm 1 is a biblical preparation <laughs> for a life of prayer. Step by step, it detaches us 
from activities and words distract us from God so that we can be attentive before him. Psalm 1 provides a kind of entryway into the place of prayer. Any comments? You'll turn to your Bibles. Psalm 1. Follow along with me. Good old hay fever. Blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, or stands in the way of sinners, or sit in the seat of mockers. Put this delight, put his delight in the Lord, in the law of the Lord, and on this law he meditates day and night. He is like a tree planted by streams of water, which yield its fruit in season, and whose leaves does not wither. Whatever he does prospers. Now to the wicked, not so the wicked. They are like chaff that the wind blows away. Therefore the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. For the Lord watches over the ways of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. Pretty straightforward, isn't it? Okay, let's go to page 11 in the book. What contrast do you notice in this psalm, within the psalm itself? Well, there's those who delight in the law, uh, the righteous, and then there's those that are wicked. Because they don't delight in the law. Yeah, yeah they... okay, yeah, delight in the law, yeah. okay. What law are we talking about? The Constitution. I think the United law States. refers to all of Scripture. Okay. I think here it does. The law is referred to a lot of times throughout Scripture. Do you have an opinion on what the law is in the Old Testament? The commandments? Amen. Yeah. Basically, that is the law. Of course, the Jewish law went on farther than that in all the things you're supposed to eat and where you wear and all that stuff. The Levitical code. The basic law of the Old Testament is the Ten Commandments. Or the Shema. I mean, you could also say it comes down to the Shema, right? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. Yeah. Well, yeah, but that's that's the law, you know, and the whole thing is Jesus Christ changed that. What if somebody said the Old Testament diagnoses the disease, the New Testament cures it. The Old Testament tells about sin, and the New Testament, through Jesus Christ, it cures that sin. Nobody's agreeing with me. Come on. Yeah, I agree. I agree. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. I know that's, uh, you know, I'm a simple minded person, so I have to go by these one liners. So, but anyway, it's, it's just one way of looking at it. But what, here again, go back to the question. There are, there are a number of different contrasts in there good and the bad <clears throat> well Basically. what about the oh i'm sorry don no go ahead what about the 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 planted tree uh compared to the shaft which blows away or is destroyed in the fire okay. right that's a good contrast one prospers and one does not Which one prospers? Which one's the tree? The righteous person? Yeah. The, the righteous. 
Do you think this totally refers back to an unrighteous person like chaff and will be blown away at the end of time? Mm -hmm. Well, I think so in a sense because the chaff is the outer shell. Mm -hmm. The valuable kernel is what's inside. And so like referring to the tree planted by the living water, if we're firmly planted in the Lord, our living source, you know, that's important. Like the kernel inside the shaft, that's what's important because the shaft's just going to be blown, you know, away. Yes, yes, yes. Very, very definitely, you know. And, and it is indicating, in my mind, it's indicating that, you know, it's what's going to happen at the end of time. The righteous will survive like a tree. And the unrighteous will be blown away as chaff. Any other comments? Let's go to question two. The first word in the psalm is blessed. Some translate it as happy. Mm -hmm. What kind of expectations should that bring to our life of prayer? Gladness. Um, that I'm fortunate. Okay. Contentment. That's a good one. Yeah. What if the prayers aren't answered? What? What if the prayers aren't answered the way we expect them to be? They're, they're all answered. Some of them are answered by no. Well, who's, but, in who's in charge of this world? I know. I sure from, a, from <laughs> the point of view of maybe a new believer who says, oh, look, I'm going to be blessed and happy in my prayer life, and yet my dad still dies of cancer. What do you say to him? What does blessing mean in that yeah. in that situation? Yeah. What is blessedness and happiness? Well, you can be blessed that you have the Lord to fall back on. Somebody else answer. I can't. Well, that's a tough one. I mean, if the dad was saved, you can, you know, be reassured that you will see him again and that his home is in heaven because that's the ultimate goal for all of us anyway this earth isn't our home but when somebody's just lost somebody and they prayed that they wouldn't you know i still struggle with that one myself because they have to have that time of grief and pain and nothing that you can say at that moment is going to take that away absolutely Absolutely. And it's something hard to say, and it's hard to say, well, it'll all work out for the best. Because it depends on what you say now. Now, I'm going to, here again, I'm going to give you my two cents worth, and you give me the change back. But sometimes, as a Christian, I think that death is the healing of a disease, of a health problem. I, I, I agree with you. I, I don't think it, it's about communicating it. I think, I think, I think this it's, is a hard psalm on the surface. If you're not, you know, Tim Keller always makes the distinction between teaching insiders versus outsiders. You know, those of us who are insiders, we're like, oh yeah, we get it. Blessedness transcends circumstance. Blessedness doesn't depend, you know, upon what's happening that day. We see a longer vision. We get that. But for outsiders, it can, it can sound like empty promises. Yeah, I, I agree. And it's, it's a hard sell and it's a, it's a tight rope to walk. Mm -hmm. And we've all seen situations where it was a blessing when they passed on. Mm -hmm. We've all seen situations where, why did it happen? Mm -hmm. You know, and, and so it's, uh, it is a tight rope to walk when you're, you're talking to people in these situations. And to say, oh, I know how you feel. There ain't no way you know how they feel. You cannot feel that unless you, uh, you can feel it about your own situation. 
and it's different. Five is right. It's different from what for each person. Yeah, in some cases it may be just to listen and not say anything. And just that's a that's a good thought. That's yeah. a good thought. And you know, as time goes on, learn from that what is happening and stay with them on it to see where they are. Yeah. As time goes on. But getting them to talk about it sometimes is a real problem also. Yeah. yeah. Any other comments? Let's go to question number three. What significance do you see in the progression from walk to stand to sit in verse one? Let's go back to our inattentiveness and think about it. I think it means we're not supposed to come become complacent. Um, we're supposed to keep walking toward that which is right, um, not sit or stand in the way of, um, you know, bad situations. Um, you know, the okay. saying bad company corrupts good morals. You know, you can try to share the word with people or let them know what you're about. But if they're, you know, knee deep in some kind of sin, you're not supposed to stand there, sit there, stay there. You're supposed to keep moving. Okay, that's a different that's a different take that I had on it, but I, I'm not going to say you're wrong by any means. Any other comments? Well, it's like walking involves much more movement than standing, and especially more than sitting. Um, I understand that not walking, you know, with the wicked. Who wants to explain to me what it means to not stand in the way of sinners? I, I think you're right. But now, now I'm going to tell you the way that I interpreted this, and you tell me that I'm, tell me I'm wrong. Is it? We're talking about being attentive to prayer, attentive to the Lord. If you're walking, you're doing something active. You're thinking about going someplace. You're thinking about doing something else. If you're standing, you might be thinking about, well, I ought to be going someplace else. But you're more apt to be able to concentrate on what's before you at the time. And on, on down the progression that when you sit, you're more apt to be intentive. Does that make any sense at all? Yeah. Uh, oh. Yeah. No, I mean, it, it makes perfect sense. And I, and I, in, in my reading, that is, that is, that is the way that many people understand that progression. Um, I've also read alternative interpretations that talk about the psalmist is simply describing a variety of positions. So whether you're walking or you're standing or you're sitting, you're doing it in the manner of the Lord. Does that make well, sense? Yeah. I, I mean, I get a lot of good praying done when I'm walking. I mean, that's one Absolutely. of my best prayer times is on a good long walk. Yeah. So, you know, there's a variety of experiences. Of right. Praying. But but and, and, and but I think the is kind of right too. And you look at it, it says you know you're not supposed to walk in the counsel of the wicked, or stand with the wicked, or sit with the mockers. Yeah, whatever you're doing. Oh, so, yeah. yeah. So you can. I think we have two interpretations here. That's the first time that ever happened, didn't it? Have two interpretations of scripture? Never happened before. My <laughs> golly, first time I ever recognized it. Okay, any other comments? Let's go to question four. The law of the Lord is contrasted with the words counsel, way, and seat. What does this contrast bring out? Which which translation were you reading, Don? Because mine, I used the NIV thinking that was what the study used. And That's NIV what it's supposed to be. 
Hmm? It's supposed to be the NIV. I read the NIV. Did you? Maybe my I version. downloaded the wrong version then. Huh, maybe I downloaded ESV. Well, you know, we talked about it when I was talking about you the other day and I brought it out and when yeah. I put it, the, the yeah, voice. I, the, I, I might have downloaded, I thought I downloaded NIV, but I might have, it might have defaulted to ESV. Well, Greg, you remember the ones that we used, and I used the um, audio of them that come off of the computer? Uh, and they, 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 varied, they varied a little bit too, but they said they were NIV. <laughs> And yeah. when I was looking at this the other day, it didn't, but my Bible, the NIV, said council. But it didn't say council in that one. But, but anyway, that's kind of nitpicking, but we'll see this throughout any translation of the Bible or translation of anything we get. But I have a little trouble with an answer to that, so I'm asking you guys. Well, I'll be honest, that's the only question in this whole thing that I didn't have an answer for. Yeah, I, I just pulled up the NIV again on Bible Gateway. And it does not use the word council. Okay, we're nitpicking though, you're right. Look, okay. Okay, yeah, but, but look look in your NIV Bible. If you look it up on the internet or whatever it is, it threw me too. Bible Gateway is what I use. Yeah. For my, yeah. But anyway. Okay. Anybody got an answer for me? I really well, don't know what he's getting at. I really don't. <laughs> <laughs> I love James okay. Anderson, but okay. I have no idea where he's going. Yeah. yeah. Well, a lot, a lot I think of I, is uh, con what I have in my study Bible here is constant contemplation for yeah. ethical direction and obedience, results of assembly, etc., not good for wicked. Um, okay. Well, I, 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 I think it's one of those things that I think it kind of ambiguous the way we look at it, but it's, it's uh, food for thought. And uh, let's go on to to uh, question five. The psalmist described the person who delights in God's law, verse two. What is your emotional response, your emotional response to scripture? Not what you believe. Not what you believe about it, but how you feel about it. For me, it's reliance. I rely on scripture. Why? Because it gets me through. Um, it's where I turn to when I'm hurting, when I'm angry, when I'm happy. I can find an answer for just about everything if I take the time and pray and go to scripture. Um, I rely on God's word to get me through. It's him communicating to me through his word. So in my opinion, it's the way he speaks to me. So when I'm praying out and asking for answers or asking for direction and I read his word, that's how he communicates to me. And that's important for my relationship with him. That's a very, very good answer. Very good. And it's an emotional type thing. We can all say, yes, I believe in scripture. And I think we do. But what's your emotional? How do you actually feel about it? Is it the answer to your problems? It can be, Vi, just like you said. Maybe if some more of us looked at it from that standpoint, it would be more useful to our culture and society today. I wish more people would look to the Bible. Um, <laughs> anything you want to know is in there. If you just pray and take the time to look. Absolutely. Absolutely. Any other well, comments? On, excuse me. Well, lately for me, um, it, it has been a delight since dad passed away. I'll be reading my devotions or 
I'll open up to something and it's like a bolt of lightning. It, that is there for me as an affirmation. Um, and I just, I look up and I say, thank you, God. Because I know. And it's just, it's comforting. It's, it's yes. very Absolutely. comforting. Absolutely. Any other comments? We kind of answered this sixth question. The tree is a central metaphor in Psalms, verse 3. Put your imagination to you. How our Lord delighted people like trees. They glow, grow and flourish. Okay. Any other comments? And they're grounded and rooted. Grounded and rooted. Okay. Number seven. Let's go ahead, Greg. Uh, continue on with that. We need light. And to me, light is, is God. And nutrients is the earth. And between them, we are able to produce results. So all, all, Bring other all people the... to God. Um, maintain our commitment to God as long as we have those essentials. Good. Yeah. Very much. And, so. and without all of those, like you just mentioned, um, the tree would die. And it's the same with us. Without all of that, we died, not necessarily physically, but spiritually and emotionally, we wither away. It's all part of God's creation, isn't it? Well, and that's, yeah, the, the tree is a central metaphor for scripture. That's what I, what I find compelling to, hear, to find it in Psalm 1 when the image of the tree is at the beginning in Genesis and at the end in Revelation 22 as a symbol of restoration. And then here in the midst of it in Psalm 1, it's saying we are the trees you know, by the nourishment of God's word. Um, it's pretty brilliant, actually, I think. Yeah, I never looked at it that way. I like that. Mm. It really fits. Yeah, it really works. Yeah. Kind of chat or question seven, in what ways are the wicked like chaff? Well, we pretty well discussed that, unless you have some other comments you'd like to make. Question eight on page 12. How do these two radical different portraits, the tree righteous and the chaff wicked, motivates you to delight in God's word? Well, because I want to be strong and able to withstand the trials, the hardships, anything that comes my way, I want to be firmly rooted and planted like the tree. I don't want to be blown away like the chaff, able to be tossed to and fro, not knowing where my direction is or where my source of strength comes from. Absolutely. Absolutely. Any other comments? Let's go on to question nine. Do you feel a gap or chism? between real life, work, school, family, and your, your prayer life, explain. We talked about a lot of distractions, but mm -hmm. what else is it? I think there really is no gap except the one that we create, right? <laughs> yeah. 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 I don't like gap. Excuse me? I think there would be a real gap there for people that don't have faith. I, I don't know. You know, I, I can't wrap my brain around where people get their strength if they don't have faith, how they can make it through certain things. Because if I didn't have it, hmm. I, I couldn't exist. Absolutely. But I, I think another thing that we're thinking about is that you're talking about we're being Sunday, Sunday Christians and something else on the rest of the week. 
Is it easier to, for you to pray on Sunday than it is on Monday or Tuesday or Wednesday? I pray the same every day of the week. So no, <laughs> for me, okay. it isn't. God bless you. I God all the time. Good. And I've found myself talking to him a lot lately. Like I said, with everything going on in the world, <laughs> if I wasn't, when the, when the scripture says pray without ceasing, you know, I'm vacuuming and I'm praying, I'm walking, I'm praying, I'm cooking dinner, I'm talking to God about something. It's, you know, to me, I have to have that. I've got a little book I'll give you that I want you to read. And right here it is. Yeah. Practice of the Presence of God. Practice of the Presence of God by Brother Lance Lawrence. Lawrence, yeah. And okay. he was a monk many years ago, but he brought this out in here, and his feeling was that God was with him, and he was with God every day. Oh, God's Lord. right here. Practicing the Presence of God. Yeah. Now, yep. It's difficult to look at it that way, but um it's really it, to me it has really changed my way of thinking the way to, to be in my prayer life now brother lawrence went to vespers morning noon and night just like all the rest of them but he lived his life with god right there beside him awesome and if we can do that i'll uh it it, it it's what I think it's what God wants us to do. I, I've got some more of these books. So I'll get you one. Thank uh, you. Greg, Greg, do you have one? No, I don't. I'd like to. Okay, I've got, yeah, I, I, I think I've got at least three more that I'll, I'll get a, to you three anyway. Any other comments on that? Now let's go to put number 10. How does meditation, listening to God speak to us through scripture, prepare us for prayer? What's meditation? Is this doing yoga? Can you meditate doing yoga? I, I don't I don't understand some of this new lingo, but I think I'd be moaning and groaning if I yeah. was doing yoga. <laughs> yeah. There is a difference. You know, a lot of people will say that if you're really doing yoga, then you're practicing another, you're technically practicing another religion. So no, you can't. But a lot of other people just, with all due respect, what they call yoga is just heavy duty stretching. So <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> yeah. The definition is. So well, yeah. I, maybe they're meditating on how bad they feel. <laughs> Oh, my hips out of yes. <laughs> that, would, that would take most of my most of my thought if I was trying to do any of this stuff. <laughs> oh, when is this, are, are here, you asking I, yourself, when is this over? I know. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah. right. Doing a lot of asking yourself, when is this over? <laughs> yeah. yeah. There's a lot of questions, but okay. So the definition I came up with in uh, meditation to engage in contemplation or reflection yeah. uh, okay that's pretty generic the second definition was to engage in mental exercise for the purpose of reaching a heightened level of spiritual awareness a mental exercise to reach a heightened level of spiritual awareness. What are you going to do to meditate? Well, I really have to quiet myself before I can even get the, yeah. the scriptures to speak to me. Because <laughs> I'm like, you know, it's I'm easily distracted. So I really have to get a time where I don't have to worry about running off or something and and carve that time out and do it and try to focus and try not to see a squirrel. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 
uh, the old the old story that the fellow went to the pastor and he said, Pastor, what can I do to to uh, hear God, pray to God? And he says, Well, he says you just go in a room all by yourself with the Bible and you read the Bible. So a week later, the pastor saw the fellow and the fellow said, Well, he says, How did you get along with it? He said, No, he says I went in the room. He said I by myself and I turned on some nice Brahms music. And the pastor said, now, wait a minute. I told you to go in there with you and God only. Now, the, the, now I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to add to that from my standpoint. Music is a form of worship. The Psalms are a form of worship that were set to music in certain places. Yep. I, belie I believe that... And I, I have to turn on. I have to turn on a nice soft music so I can take a nap in my big soft chair. I've got other music that I listen to that I know the words to it. I either whistle to it or sing to it. I'm not meditating. I'm not even trying to go to sleep. So if you use music, use something that takes your mind completely off of it. Any more comments on that? How can you put more meditation into your life? Uh, to, to devote a certain time of day that's uh, good, a good time to do it. Um, now I find mornings are the best for me. Yeah. yeah. But. Okay. Yeah. Well, before the rest of the world gets started. Yeah. Yeah. You know. But you have, in a busy world, we have to take time to do it. Being retired adds a lot to your ability to concentrate, well, not necessarily concentrate, but to meditate on what's going on. And if you change it, if you turn off the dead gum news, it's a lot easier to talk to God. Any other comments on that right now? Question number 12. Some prayer is spontaneous, a word of thanks, a cry of pain. Other prayers routine at meals in public worship. But a life of prayer requires preparation, a procedure for moving from inattention to attention. The same method will not suit everyone. How can you develop an approach to meditation that fits your circumstances and development? Kind of a personal question. Anybody want to try and answer? Well, I've just tried different things and try to find what works best for me. Mm -hmm. And that's not allowing my, well, I do get my cup of coffee, but it, but it doesn't allow me to have any other distraction. I oh, can't yeah. have any background noise or Music would probably be okay, but I, and for sure not any television, just carve out a time and do it. Yeah, and, and, and pick a time, I think pick a time. I'm, I'm not the best at this. I, I, like Brother Lawrence, I like to think that I'm with him all the time. I know he's with me, am I with him? And so, you know, to, to live that, that way. Any other comments? We've come to the end of the guidebook. I, I have to back up on some things that I've said previously. I always said when I taught a Sunday school class or a uh, Bible study that I would try and get us to read the whole Bible. Well, our guidebook leaves out quite a few of the different, of the, but I, Hopefully you'll read some of those and, and bring it into the focus of what that, that he does not cover. Mm -hmm. uh, but he covers them pretty well in a, in a good way of, of what we'll be doing. Any other comments on tonight's meeting? If not, thank you. Let him not enjoyed let him, it. Yeah, thank you. Let me close with a word of prayer. Hey, Don, real quick. 
um, a little bit of housekeeping. Um, there were a couple people who couldn't get on tonight for a variety of reasons. If you know of others who want to join, they're welcome to do so. We have some more books on order. Um, not everybody who wanted a book got a book. So we'll keep plugging along and okay. hopefully um, encourage uh, some more people. And just a word of logistics too, Don and I will be taking turns leading the discussion week to week with the exception of, uh, fingers crossed, some, some weeks in October when hopefully I'll finally get my sinus surgery accomplished. So um, thanks, Don, for covering a bunch of weeks in the middle there. So that's how we're handling it. Okay. Anything else before we go to the Lord in prayer? Let us pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time together. We thank you for this opportunity to get together and to study your word. Lord, we are so grateful for all that you have provided for us. Even this country that we're in such turmoil right now, we still have the right to worship you in the open. And may we learn to worship you so that others may be see the love that we have for you and the love that you have for us. May we continue to grow in your word, continue to grow and pass this on to those who do not know you. Lord, this is uh, so important in this day and age that we ask that you continue to be with us and guide us in all the things that we do and we think. And most of all, dear Lord, we thank you for your son, Jesus Christ, who died on the cross for us. In his name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Bye-bye. See you, Bye -bye. See you okay. Sunday Bye -bye. before. Okay. Okay. Good night, everybody. Good night. Bye.